today's episode of Still to be Determined, we're going to talk about whether it's worth paying a bit more now to ensure you're doing the right thing for the future, or whether, well, costs are just too high for you to begin with. So unfortunately, you can't go that route. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Still to be Determined. As usual, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And I'm also curious about tech. Luckily for me, my younger brother is Matt Farrell from Undecided with Matt Farrell. Matt, how you doing? I'm doing pretty well. How about you? It's a rainy day here in the uh, New York City area, but other than that, I'm not complaining. Today, we're going to be talking about why heat pumps are essential for the future explained, which is a title that somehow confuses me. I don't know. It's the explained <laughs> at the end or I don't know, but this is from June 7th, 2022. And as you might've guessed from the title, we're going to talk about heat pumps. Heat pumps all the way, baby. That's right. <laughs> as I like to say, heat pump up the jam. That, oh, Sean. I couldn't help it. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't help it. So try a little harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to start us off, you're effectively taking your this sounds to me like it's basically taking an approach of passive physics providing heating and cooling that it's just you're not mm-hmm. forcing anything into a system that isn't already there. You're just moving what's in one place to another place and that's taking care of the work for you. Do I have it in a nutshell? In a, in a, in a more nutshell. Passive, yes. More passive than a classic like a a gas powered heating system or a AC system, which is going to be actively. Well, the thing to keep in mind is a refrigerator is a heat pump. An air conditioner is a heat pump. It's just a one way heat pump. The heat pumps I'm talking about are like two way. So you can cool and you can heat a space. It's just which way you're pumping that heat where a refrigerator is only pumping the heat outside of the box to make the inside super cold. It's this is, can go either way that's a very helpful clarification for me because i spent most of this video thinking what's a heat pump (laughs) then i i failed (laughs) (laughs) just a few comments that were in the comment section on youtube one of them that stood out for me from wayun six who wrote about the video itself you weren't lying when you were hyping up your animation team once again however you hired them to do the animations that are so good at making incredible visuals that they're easy to understand i really do think they ate a lot in understanding these concepts for visual learners massive kudos to the overall fine level of detail so just wanted to give a shout out to you and your entire team for putting together a really well done visual video well some a lot of the visuals we didn't create Mm -hmm. some some we did some we didn't so it's like it kind of comes down to the places that we're sourcing them from it's like there's a lot of good materials out there and i also have a really good team that's good on creating them as well as finding them Mm -hmm. (laughs) so yeah how many of those are made by the manufacturers of these systems that you're talking about there's a fair number it's like you'd be surprised it's a lot of these heat pump companies are trying to convey this very complex idea. So a lot of these animations are from the companies that make that thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And do you see a skewing in one direction or the other where are these manufacturers looking largely at homeowners or are they looking at corporate larger spaces? I imagine that this might be affected by scale in a very difficult way for larger spaces to incorporate this technology it seems to me like this would be more on the scale of a home so do they tend to be marketing themselves more directly to individual consumers like yourself they market it in different ways like most of the animations and the promo materials that we found that we could use in the video are geared towards consumers and i think the reason that we see more of that is because most consumers don't completely understand what a heat pump is right they may have heard oh heat pumps don't work and it's just a meme that has gone on for the past 30 years but things have changed over the past couple decades and the heat pumps are really good now can go work in really cold temperatures but yet there's still that pervasive belief of that doesn't work 
So these companies have to market to consumers to try to re-educate people to understand, no, you, you, you really should consider this. What Where, was it that didn't used to work? It was the, the temperatures. So like, I remember you and I, I remember there was a time, I can't remember which house we were living in, but mom and dad had to get a new, something done with the furnace. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about how heat pumps don't work. And they knew somebody that had a heat pump. And when it got super cold outside, it couldn't keep the house warm enough. So they were always too cold in the middle of winter. And that's that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. It's that if it gets down to 20 degrees or 15 degrees outside, I'm talking Fahrenheit, not Celsius. Mm -hmm. You're talking about in 30 years ago, a heat pump might struggle. And so inside your house, it might be 65. But you want it to get to 70 or 72 and it can't quite get there. It's struggling to get you to the temperature that you want it to be at. Right. That's really not the case anymore. There are heat pumps. Heat pumps work all the way down to like negative 15 degrees or more, but they have to use more energy to create it. So that that in the video, I talked about the COP of three to five, mm -hmm. where you're getting like 300% return on the amount of electricity you're putting it in. When The colder it gets, that COP drops. So it's like if you got down to that negative 15 degrees outside, you your COP might be one. <laughs> or right. something like that so it's not that they can't get you the temperature you want inside but the efficiency drops and what about the opposite are heat pumps have they just always been more efficient in warm weather as far as air conditioning is concerned i mean you mentioned that effectively acs and refrigerators are heat pumps so is this a thing where it was always seen as like well when hot weather they work great but in cold weather they're a no-go I mean, there is a there is a cap where they can't really keep up on the hot end of things, but you're talking incredibly high temperatures. So yes, in general, they tend to work better in hotter climates than they do in colder climates. Mm -hmm. But again, that's not really the case anymore. So like in my house that I'm working on building, I'm going to be getting a geothermal system and it's going to be rated to something like, I can't remember what it is. It's <laughs> negative 15 degrees Celsius. And they gave me this entire like spreadsheet showing what the what the temperatures are, what the COP will end up being at those temperatures, and that I might want to get like uh, an additional resistive heater installed at like the most extreme temperatures if I want to make sure that I'm getting to the temperature I want. So they were talking about like, you know, when it gets super cold, it's going to keep your house warm, but it may not be the temperature you want it to be. So you might want to do this. It also depends on how they're sizing the system. And I got different quotes from different geothermal companies. And one was saying you need to get a geothermal, I mean, a, 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 a additional heat heater for those two or three days a year where it gets crazy cold. And then another company, I'm dealing with water furnace, the system they're putting in is actually a more efficient system. And so I don't need to get a resistive heater at all. It, this, this system I'm getting put in will be able to handle the entire full temperature range year round for the area I live in with no problems. And so you're mm -hmm. talking about sub-zero temperatures and my systems can be just fine. I wanted to share this comment from Julia Nugent who wrote, yes, I am all in on heat pumps. As an architect, I've been involved with both air source and ground source over the years. And here's my take on the two. Ground source is more efficient and will last longer, but installs are complex because you are never 100% sure on condition until you start drilling or digging. Air source yep. are much more predictable, but I worry about sending hot air back into the environment in urban settings, contributing to heat island effect. Have you heard of heat island before? Yes. Do you you live in a, a place bit? where you... I know I do. You live in a place with heat island You want to talk about it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This may be a bad way to describe it, but anyway, it's like, in a, think about a city. All the concrete and the pavement and the buildings... During the day, it's superheating. It's capturing the the stone, the pavement, the concrete is absorbing all that heat and it hangs on to it. And then overnight, it's just like the radiating, the never ending heat. So it's like if you're in a city on a hot day, it actually feels hotter than it would be if you lived out in the suburbs right. or out in a rural area. So there, there's this heat island effect of if you are, if everybody had a heat pump and they're all pumping that heat from the inside of their house to the outside of the house, is it going to make that worse? From what I have seen, that is not the case. This is not going to impact local climate because you're not adding heat. You're just moving it. So right. it's not like... <laughs> the sun is actually so it's increasing like, the temperature of the buildings and the concrete. And 
I would also add to that when you have those high temperatures, people are running their ACs more. And so you end up with the heat generated from the air conditioning units mm-hmm. just because yeah. they get physically hot. So it's all of that is, um, yeah, I can absolutely testify. I can absolutely testify yeah. to that mid July to mid August at night, you go outside and you're like, why is the ground so gross? And <laughs> It's that heat heat radiating through your sneakers. It's not yes. a comfortable feeling. It doesn't it doesn't yeah. add to the joy of being in a city during the summer. So, yeah, heat pumps should not make that heat island effect worse. That's kind of what I was seeing in all the research that I've done on this. It's it's not going to help. It's not going to make it worse. It's just kind of like it probably is going to be more of just like, like a six of one, half a dozen of the other. Right. So. But that's as Julia is pointing out. That's only for air sourced heat pumping the alternative being Mm -hmm. ground so that's when you're drilling down into the ground and you're pulling up is it the is it groundwater where you're circulating groundwater no it can be it Mm -hmm. can be there are geothermal systems that do that you can have a vertical well or you can have a horizontal well where you Mm -hmm. basically dig six feet down or something like that and then you put a coil and then you just put the dirt back on top of it Or Mm -hmm. you drill hundreds of feet straight down and then you put basically a tube that goes way down the well and then comes back up the well. That's what I'm having done. Mm -hmm. Uh, My house is going to have to drill, I think it's 320 feet straight down and it just has to be one well. So one tube that will go down then come back up and what, and then there's a fluid that gets pumped through that tube. And so as the, the earth hundreds of feet down is a constant temperature all year round. Mm -hmm. So you're basically just moving the heat from inside your house and dropping it into the earth, which is actually cooling that tube down so that the cool air comes back up for air conditioning. Mm-hmm. Or in the winter, it's actually heating that tube up deep into the earth and the heat, the hotter fluid has come back in the house, getting compressed and vaporized and turned into heat from the house. Are you going to so have some it, sort of short, backup? Basically how it works. What was that? Are you going to have some sort of backup system in case these systems don't work to the level that you're hoping? And what happens no, if the, the when they're back- drilling down and then they hit oil? Are you going to close your YouTube <laughs> channel and just get a large <laughs> 10 gallon hat and become an oil baron? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what's going to yeah. happen. I'll start Screw working renewable on energy in the environment. Yeah. I'm going to be start selling my oil. <laughs> I'll start uh, working on the song. Let me tell you a story about a man named Matt. <laughs> there was this comment from Simon Moore. Presumably you're planning to insulate your house to passive house standards. So you should need Mm -hmm. very little additional heating, in which case it might be much more cost effective and simpler to maintain to use simpler infrared panel heaters. Also, you might consider using a simple airing cupboard to dry cloth slowly and efficiently rather than using a tumble dryer. Are you going to those lengths where you're, you're looking at alternatives for everything from like how you're drying your clothes to you know using infrared mm-hmm. paneling in that way i'm not going to be using infrared paneling i actually did look into that when you, you look at talk the about what efficiency. it is a little bit um if you ever been to a restaurant or a bar that has outside seating and it's kind of cool and they yeah. have these giant like pillars with these heater things that are kind of like up above you that keep yeah. you warm in that area that's an infrared heater okay so there are these infrared panels that you can get that look like a painting that might be on your wall or something like that, or a mirror. But what what it's actually doing is it's irradiating (laughs) the area with heat and it it emulates sunlight. So when sunlight hits your skin, you feel warm, but it's actually not warming the air. It's really kind of weird. Okay. So the air temperature in your room could be 55 degrees or 60 degrees, but you feel all nice and toasty warm because you're getting baked in this light. It's neat. But when you look at the energy efficiency, it does not match geothermal heat. So it's like if you're talking a heat pump that has three to five COP, these do not have that. So it's much closer to that. It's not one to one. It is better than that, but it's mm-hmm. it's not. it doesn't come close. So it's like you are going to use a little more energy, even though you can keep the air temperature lower. So you can use it as a supplemental system. So I could have a geothermal system that's keeping the house at 60 degrees instead of 70 and then you have these panels around the house that are only turned on when you're in a room. So in theory, you're saving energy because you only need to use it at targeted times. But it's like, for me, that's like, it's a step too far. It's like, I, that's 
diminishing returns because my house is going to be super insulated, super <laughs> energy efficient. I had one HVAC guy say to me, your house is going to be so energy efficient. It's the kind of thing where you could light a couple candles in a room and, and after they've you... been burning for 20 minutes, you will feel the difference. Mm. It's like it, that's how efficient this house is going to be. So at that point, it's like using these infrared panels. It's like, no, it's just that's it's going to be completely unnecessary. So when I visit you, I should anticipate that it's going to be lit like a Zen monastery. It's just going to be <laughs> yes. candles everywhere. Welcome in. Yeah. Sit on the pillow on the floor, Sean. Like, was that a gong was sound? That, Where did that come from? Is that your wife? <laughs> Would you like some green tea? <laughs> <laughs> there was this comment. And again, just a reminder, everybody, jump into the comments. We love hearing from you. We love uh, getting responses to previous videos. And we love weighing in on the current stuff. Like this one from Herdy Vandermish, who wrote, great video. Thank you for it. The cooling gases used in heat pumps are often a hundred times more greenhouse potent than CO2. So they must be very carefully installed and disposed of at the end of their life. I thought that's an important thing to mention. And I was wondering mm -hmm. in your research, do you, have you seen the same thing as uh, that commenters pointed out? Are these chemicals that are you know, going to be more impactful in the environment and what is the long-term management around that? Yes, they're right. In the video I talked about, I can't remember what the number is. It's like R123A or something. I can't remember the, the exact number of the mm -hmm. fluid. Mm -hmm. And several commenters pointed out that there's actually a different one now that's called R2 something. Um, I'm blanking on the number on that D2, one too. D2, I believe it is. But it's more efficient. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's better at colder temperatures, but there's also differences in the chemical makeup of what it is uh, to make it a little more environmentally friendly. Mm -hmm. But yes, these are, it's like, you remember we used to have Freon? Freon yeah. used to be in all the, these air conditioners and it actually turned out to be a bad thing for like the ozone. And so we moved away from Freon. The same thing is happening with these different coolant mixtures that we have now where we no longer really use Freon, but we use different things. So yeah, you do have to properly dispose of it. But when you're talking about, it's a hundred times worse than CO2, it's also when it's probably disposed of, it's not an issue at all. So it's, it's a controllable substance. There's proper regulations around it. We can, we can manage this. It's mm -hmm. not something that we have to become overly concerned about as long as we're <laughs> doing things the right way and have the proper guidance and requirements around all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So my final question goes back to my opening statement. And there were a few commenters in the same vein. There was one person who said he agreed with everything you said about the efficacy of heat pumps the problem is mm -hmm. the upfront costs and the maintenance the the running of it is just more than natural gas and so he's in a position where he's like the cost of natural gas is just cheaper for me than what this would be so i wanted to get your feedback on costs is that a universal truth or is that does that sound to you like there's something going on regionally where the cost of natural gas in one area might be cheap enough but in another area that's not gonna add up to the same numbers yeah that sounds very regional to me it probably depends heavily on what his natural gas prices are and what his electricity prices are in his specific area yeah for me i looked at going geothermal in my current house and I, my, get, my current heat is natural gas. And when I looked at the numbers and looked at the differences of what that it would be, it was not going to be financially viable for me to go geothermal because natural gas prices are so cheap. The cost of putting the system in, when you did like the, over the next 15, 20 years, it's not going to be that huge of a difference. And so it's kind of like, ee, and it's not really worth that extra cost. Mm -hmm. For my new house, I don't have a system. I have to get a system. And so it was kind of right. like, so I'm going in, I'm going in fresh. And when you look at the numbers from that perspective, it obviously does make sense for me to go like air source heat pump or geothermal. So in that case, it was a no brainer where I would kind of push back on him. It depends on what he's comparing because there are air source heat pumps that are extremely affordable up front and would, <laughs> unless his electricity prices are super expensive. Like if his natural gas is cheap, but his electricity is expensive. Mm -hmm. It's like, unless that is the case. I would kind of push back and say he probably has not priced out all the different options that are out there. 
Mm. But for something like geothermal, chance in his situation, he's probably right that it wouldn't make sense. And if you were to give guidance around like where could somebody go to see numbers to be able to crunch those numbers, where would you send them? Oh boy, that's t- that's really tough. Um, Maybe that's part of the difficulty here is there's not a centralized place to be able to compare these numbers. Yeah, I can't. It's it's still not public, but there's a company that I've dealt with a lot that does things around solar. They're working on a kind of a heat pump guide Mm -hmm. that might help with this kind of thing. Um, There's, if depending on your state, like here in Massachusetts, there's a program called Mass Save. Mass Save has calculators and things that can help you figure out if it's going to be worth it for you and what the benefits are and what the costs are and if there's rebates and all that kind of stuff. So there might be something for your specific state and location that might have Mm -hmm. guides but it's going to be very regional. There really is no good, I've never found one, a good kind of like countrywide, hey, go here and just plug in your numbers and you'll get some interesting information. It's, I haven't seen one of those quite yet. That's unfortunate. Maybe that's a million dollar idea that you and I should follow up on. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So listeners, let us know, where do you land on this? Are you willing to pay more for the overall benefit upfront the way Matt is because you're building a new home? Are you in a current home where the upfront costs are just too much to transfer over? What do you think about all of that? And what do you think could be done about that? Do you think this is a place where more governmental programs and rebates to incentivize transition would be worth it? Let us know in the comments, or you can find the contact information in the podcast description. Don't forget, if you'd like to support the show, You can do that by simply reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever it was you found this podcast. And if you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to stilltvd.fm, click on the Become a Supporter button, and it allows you to throw coins at our heads, and we enjoy each and every bruise that we get. On YouTube, you can also click on the Join button and become a member that way. All of that really does help support the show. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you're on YouTube, and we'll see you next time.